joining us from the UK and afar. Um, I would like to begin first by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and the Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today. I would also like to extend that respect to the First Nations peoples from the land from which you join us from today. My name is James Conodaris. I'm a director in the communications group at Squire Patton Boggs and a committee member of the Australian chapter of the International Institute of Communications. Today's session will focus on the proposed reforms to protect Australia's critical infrastructure and systems of national significance. We'll also touch on how these reforms compare with the regulatory framework in Europe and the key developments currently taking place as the European Union reviews its cybersecurity rules. Now, despite the COVID situation in Sydney foiling our initial plans to host today's session as an in-person event, a fair bit of agility is required in the current circumstances and we really appreciate you joining us uh, here online. Before I hand you over to our moderator to kick things off, um, I would like to say a big thank you to all our speakers, um, my colleagues at Squire Patton Boggs and fellow IIC committee members for their time and effort in bringing you today's event. Our moderator for today is Michael Coonan, co-vice president of the IIC Australian chapter and also head of regulatory and government affairs at the public broadcaster SBS. Michael is a media and communications policy and regulatory leader with experience in both government roles. He joined SBS in August 2017 after nearly five years at Foxtel. In these roles, Michael has worked on a broad range of policy and regulatory issues, including local content regulation, broadcasting privacy, codes of practice, spectrum and technical regulations. Prior to Foxtel, Michael spent eight years at the Australian Communications and Media Authority in both broadcasting and telecommunications regulatory areas. I'll now pass you over to Michael, who will make some introductory remarks and also introduce you to the great panel of speakers that we're very privileged to have with us here today. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, James, and good evening, everyone. And thanks from me uh, to you for joining our event, our IIC Australian chapter event on cybersecurity and critical infrastructure with Hamish, Min, Ben and Matthew, who are recognised leaders in their fields and who I'll introduce in more detail shortly. I too would like to acknowledge the Wumbul and Kadigal people who are the traditional custodians uh, of the land that I'm on here in Sydney tonight and pay respects to the elders of this land, both past and present. Our guests are joining from Canberra, the Gold Coast and Melbourne, as well as from the UK. So I'd also like to acknowledge the First Nations people of each of those lands. I'd like to thank very much James, Matthew and Squire Patton Boggs for generously hosting us and in particular for Matthew, uh, joining us at this early hour from the UK. A number of you, uh, as a number of you may know, the IIC is an independent global body based in London with chapters around the world. It exists to advance the debate and understanding of regulatory policy in the communications industry. However, our focus inevitably broadens when we start looking at multi-sector issues like cybersecurity and critical infrastructure. In preparing for this event, I picked up a copy of this week's Economist magazine, which has in big letters across the front cover, the surging cyber threat from spies and crooks. And uh, while the copy editors obviously took a playful tone with the headline, the journalists cite a number of big recent cyber incidents that don't sound like much fun. For example, the article notes that in May, cyber criminals shut down the pipelines supplying almost half of the oil to America's east coast. Uh, for five days, the attack on the Colonial Pipeline Company. And in that case, a $4.3 million ransom was demanded. If data the new oil, then this one was truly a mix of the two. Then there was the incident affecting many hospitals in Ireland, where the health service executive was also hit by a ransomware attack. One article I read said that many hospitals in the network still didn't have computers a week on. Closer to home and in the industry in which I work, you may have seen the recent story on 60 Minutes about the cyber attack that hit the Nine Network in March. The story characterised the attack as being like modern warfare, and the Nine CTO described it as a significant, sophisticated and complex attack, which meant the company had to disconnect its corporate network from the internet, separate systems from each other, and effectively switch off the lights for a period. So whether it's oil keeping cars on the road, hospitals keeping people alive, or infrastructure that protects Australians with news and information that's vital for a well-functioning democracy. The effects are all very significant in their own way. And it'll be interesting to discuss in this forum how the government's new critical infrastructure scheme would support those sectors. 
Then there's also the recent introduction of the opposition's ransomware payments bill, which would establish a mandatory reporting requirement for Commonwealth entities, state or territory agencies, corporations and partnerships who make ransomware payments. It's interesting to consider the impacts of paying ransom on the risk of committing a crime, for example, through payment to a terrorist organisation, the creation of precedents to pay, and how this might affect cyber insurance premiums, a market which I understand is hardening. So in terms of housekeeping for tonight, there's a few things to cover. If you experience any technical difficulties with this WebEx session or have a general question, please um, send that via the chat page. Asking for assistance, that'll be picked up by our IT support colleague, or you can email Christy, whose email we'll put in the chat. As a reminder, this event's being recorded and during the presentation, all participants will remain in listen only mode. We'll be hosting uh, a Q&A session at the end of the webinar and we encourage you to use the Q&A panel in the lower right of your screen uh, at any time of the presentation uh, to add a question. Please type your questions, select all panellists and press send. Time permitting, we'll get to all of them um, at the end of the session, but if we run out of time, questions will be taken offline and we'll provide a response uh, by email and coming days. As I've said to the panellists, that said, if they see a question they'd like to answer on the spot or in context, please feel free. So finally, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who's Hamish Hansford. Hamish is First Assistant Secretary of Cyber, Digital and Technology Policy at the Australian Government's Department of Home Affairs. Hamish leads Australia's cybersecurity and cybercrime policy, online harms policy, including counter, countering terrorism and child exploitation, encryption policy, as well as technology security policy. He's previously worked in areas including surveillance, investigatory powers and law, uh, lawful access reforms, as well as reforms to countering money laundering and terrorist financing. Hamish has held senior executive positions in a range of Australian government departments, including the former Australian Land Commission. So with that, Hamish, I'll hand over to you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Michael, and it's a, a great pleasure to be here. And um, we're here virtually as opposed to a physical event. And I think that underpins how COVID's really changed um, the criticality of communications and video conferences like the one that we're on. Uh, Michael, I think you outlined um, the threat environment pretty well. And um, it's something that the, the government was thinking very much about in late 2019 when it effectively made a, a pretty unprecedented decision to add to the 2016 cyber security strategy that was only then a couple of years old and fundamentally um, look at the environment that had changed in the three years since the government um, started to develop the cyber security strategy and, and throughout the consultations in 2019 and, and 2020 the big resounding issue that was then I think amplified by COVID with people working from home and relying on uh, communications technology and, and video conferences and uh, businesses across Australia becoming more and more digitally focused. It really then led to um, a cybersecurity strategy that the then um, industry advisory panel chaired by uh, Telstra's Andy Penn came to the conclusion that the most immediate and pressing concern for Australia in the cyber security vector was really around critical infrastructure. And then that started a, a quick design and co-design of legislation and a new regime that is principally the focus, I think, of today's um, session. And, and so we were thinking about how to, what sectors do we capture? And in, and in doing so, we came up with 11 um, sectors that we really think um, have a range of different implications for Australia. The first is the uh, critical infrastructure that underpins our prosperity, uh, and then critical infrastructure that is so integral to the functioning of our society that if there was a security issue and a national security issue, um, that, that's kind of the second pillar. And then third is really the defence of the nation and, and particularly um, from kinetic attack on in the homeland. So th they're kind of the three areas that we looked at of the 11 sectors which impact our economy. And there's a couple of ways about um, going about how do you uplift cyber security um, and in the case of the critical infrastructure reforms before par uh, Parliament all has its security actually because it includes physical security, supply chain security, personnel security and cyber security and covers everything from uh, natural disasters to terrorist and other security events, espionage related events as well as uh, cyber security but critically cyber has been the vector which 
uh, we say has changed the most, I think, over the last couple of years. Um, so there's a couple of ways of going about it. First is you can pull together a piece of legislation which is effectively market forming in the sense that it articulates all of the critical infrastructure in one place and cross references the regulatory and legislative regimes which is, exist across the economy. That's clearly the approach the government has favoured and, and is, rep, is um, demonstrated by the bill before the parliament, but, but it's not a, the only pr approach. Uh, we, we followed the, very much the French approach, which um, legislated in, in 2013 and then has subsequently um, changed their critical infrastructure legislation since. We in Australia legislated a um, Security of Critical Infrastructure Act in 2018, targeting four sectors, and at the same time did telecommunications sector reforms. Uh, but other countries have decided to regulate um, across the economy in individual regulatory lanes, whether it's telecommunications sector, the finance and banking sector. So I think um, what's the benefit of the security of critical infrastructure reforms before the parliament? And the very first benefit is that um, the Australian government can in one place articulate all of the critical infrastructure assets which fundamentally underpin our economy. So I think that's the, the first point. The second point is that increasingly critical infrastructure assets are interdependent and the, an impact in the power sector, for instance, fundamentally impacts the telecommunications sector, which I'm sure would be of relevance for everyone on this line today. So the, the government's chosen to outline a, a new bill in parliament, and um, I'll take you through the kind of core components, because I think once you look at it in its entirety, it is both logical and evidence-based in terms of how the bill was pulled together. So the first thing it does, as I've said, is pull together a definition of 11 critical sectors to the economy. And the second thing it does is to say within those 11 sectors, there will be a definition of critical infrastructure assets. And we're thinking, um, and our initial estimates have been, that's around 1,700 to 2,000 critical infrastructure assets uh, representing less than 2% of GDP, but those that are critical to the functioning of our society. And to those critical infrastructure assets, uh, we've set out a regime which says um, for the assets, we'd like to have a positive security obligation, which when you boil it down is, is really effectively what companies and critical infrastructure owners should already be doing to comply with uh, the Corporations Act, for instance, and other legislative requirements. But it makes explicit that uh, there's a risk management program required to make sure that the critical infrastructure asset um, has appropriate security in place to continue its functioning and protect itself against um, uh, particularly cyber attacks, but also um, the range of security threats. So that's really, really the first element of the positive security obligation. The second is really around keeping a register of interests, and that goes to issues of um, ownership and uh, key contractual obligations, which I think impacts on the supply chain. And then the third element, which is a, really a, a new thing to deal with cyber security is to have cyber security incident reporting. And there's, there's two reports in there, one a 12 hour report for a major cyber security incident that's impacting the functioning of an asset. And then a 72 hour report to the, our Australian Cyber Security Centre um, of a, other cyber security incidents that are, are above a certain threshold. That's really trying to get early advice and warning about a cyber incident that may well be affecting the operation of a critical infrastructure asset. And so that's that's the regime around assets. We then thought about, well, actually, there are some assets which are so critical to the functioning of society that they impact multiple different sectors. And I, I talked about the interlinkages of critical infrastructure assets. And we've defined a, a new term, which is a, a system of national significance. And actually, um, every system of national significance will also be a critical infrastructure asset. But for those um, systems which we, we will co-design and come to a view together about that if they were to be interrupted or have a prolonged period of, um, of impact, particularly from a cyber perspective or only from a cyber perspective, um, that, that actually there should be additional elements that form part of the protection of the system of national significance. And, you know, we, we haven't um, finalised the, the list of systems of national significance. We've been co-designing the, the rules around different sectors and are trying to work um, with individual sectors to pull together the systems of national significance. 
But to those systems, there are, is what we, we're calling an enhanced cyber security obligation, which includes um, incident management um, guides and protocols to be developed, exercise regimes, which could be um, instigated. And particularly um, of interest is having uh, the transmission of telemetry on and sensors on individual systems of national significance so that in real time we can realize the aims of the cyber security strategy which set out um, 24 7 real-time monitoring of cyber security for our critical infrastructure assets and threat sharing between industry and government and government and industry and so for those particular systems of national significance, they're, they're, they will be integral to early warning of a sustained and large cyber attack across multiple um, critical infrastructure assets. And you've talked about some of, uh, Michael, the, the real life scenarios and colonial pipelines, a, a great example of the impact, um, the significant impact to society. If that was replicated across different um, critical infrastructure assets as well, outside of the pipeline, the multiplying effect um, of a, in, in our language, a system of national significance and multiple uh, multiple impacts on those systems going down is kind of the nightmare scenario. So this provides additional cybersecurity around those particular systems. And, and so that's the, the heart of the obligations. But then we, we sat down and, and also thought, well, there are some unique tools that particularly the Australian Signals Directorate, um, given their mandate to conduct offensive offshore cyber um, operations and to protect the nation, uh, that there are some tools that the Australian uh, Signals Directorate and, and in particular the Australian Cyber Security Centre can bring to rectify an incident. So we, we thought about a regime that deals with a particularly significant incident and we've set the threshold uh, for what we're calling the government assistance regime, which will, would apply to any critical infrastructure asset in, in, in those 11 sectors if there was a particular um, incident that reached a certain threshold and the threshold is impacting our prosperity potentially across multiple sectors having major security issues that we would have a, an escalated regime where we could help industry rectify an issue and get a critical infrastructure asset back and functioning and that really goes to and i think uh, in in some of the the media i might contend that it's it's been um demonstrate or remarked upon to say that it's the government stepping in and running a critical infrastructure, it actually isn't. It's the government coming in and working, hopefully collaboratively with a critical infrastructure asset to rectify the cyber incident, and then completely stepping out. That's the extent of the powers. And so there are information gathering powers to gather information about the incident. There's directions powers to direct the resolution of an incident. And then there are at the very peak end used to be used in extremely limited circumstances, the ability for the Australian government and with the approval of the Prime Minister, the Minister for Defence and the Minister for Home Affairs to assist industry in a compulsory way. So that would see um, the Australian um, Signals Directorate assist the Minister for Home Affairs to rectify a cyber security incident and to try and get with the whole um, result to try and get the asset back online and functioning. So that, that's um, effectively in, in my 10 minute um, spot the, the entire regime um, from start to finish and really keen to hear your questions and, and talk about uh, your views about the critical infrastructure reforms before the parliament. But I think the threat environment, the, the views of industry that we spoke to about the criticality of focusing on critical infrastructure and the legislative design that we've put in place, um, I think sets Australia up for a, a pretty good place should the parliament um, support the passage of the legislation to change the um, focus on critical infrastructure and then um, to try and make sure that we're both protecting, preventing, and then have the ability to respond to cyber incidents into the future. And then the job is to, to move on to the rest of the economy with a range of different mechanisms to have everything from behavioural change to um, voluntary principles to education and awareness, but a particular focus um, this year on critical infrastructure. Fantastic. Thank you, Hamish. Perfect timing as well. <laughs> um, I think it's really interesting to hear about, you know, we can talk later about the comparisons to those other schemes in other jurisdictions, and you mentioned the French scheme. So things like the cross references between sectors like telco, which are already quite regulated and, and the complementarity between the schemes.
And co-design, I mean, that, that's also a really important part, especially, I guess, when you're stepping into, was it 11 new sectors? So, you know, Certainly is. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, well, next we'll move to Min. Um, Min's the chair of the Oceania Cyber Security Centre um, advisory board. She's an industry professor at the School of Information Technology at Deakin University and former manager of security intelligence and insights at NBN Co Limited. As industry professor, Min specialises in the intersection of security with technology, societal and policy issues. So very much to some of those points that Hamish just mentioned. Min started her career in the Australian Signals Directorate where she was awarded three Australian Intelligence Community Medallions for outstanding service. And she's also worked at consulting firms PwC and KPMG. At NBN Co, Min established the Security Intelligence Centre acting as Executive Advisor on National Security and Cyber Policy. That I'll hand over to you, Min. Thanks, Michael. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to speak to this issue today. Uh, before I kick off, just want to send well wishes to everyone who's dialing in from Sydney. Uh, being in Melbourne myself, fully appreciate what a nerve wracking time it is um, at the moment. So absolutely hoping that uh, the worst case scenario is avoided and you don't find yourselves into an extended lockdown, which is, is definitely unpleasant. So all the best to everyone up there. Um, as you articulated, I think really well, Michael, the cyber threat landscape and the, the security threat landscape, broadly speaking, is changing quite rapidly. Uh, and it's a welcome emphasis on government from the perspective of critical infrastructure entities uh, that they are taking the security challenges to these industries very seriously. Uh, and yeah, I, I don't think there would be any uh, industry or entity within the new definition of a critical infrastructure entity uh, who would disagree with the, the concept that securing our critical assets is absolutely essential. Uh, in principle, across the board, um, I, I don't think there's any controversy there whatsoever. Uh, where I think uh, the view of industry probably does uh, diverge a bit from government is in the operationalization of uh, the new regulations uh, and, and what that looks like in practice. Um, and as Hamish has alluded to, there's uh, the co-design process for exactly that reason, to try to come up with a regime that is practical and it works and has real and, and tangible outcomes in terms of reducing the overall risk profile for critical infrastructure entities. Uh, and that's uh, certainly been the case in telco. Um, in my experience within uh, telecommunications, obviously until recently I uh, was with NBN, uh, there has been a very proactive and front-footed approach to security, both from government in terms of the regulations it's put in place on the telecommunications sector and from the telco entities themselves uh, with the understanding that uh, the CIA triad, the, the golden triad of security, of confidentiality, confidentiality, integrity and availability is absolutely fundamental to telco as a practice. It's how telecommunications are able to operate uh, and satisfy the needs of their customers, who is ultimately the, the entirety of the Australian population. And the telco sector security reforms that came into effect 2017-18 uh, uh, could almost be viewed as a precursor to this new uh, Security of Critical Infrastructure Act and amendments. Um, the TSSR, I think, uh, has been quite successful in uplifting the overall security of telecommunications. The obligations are very clearly understood within the sector, and it's overall led to a very forward-facing and proactive approach to managing security from that all-hazards perspective. Uh, the legislation specifically says that telcos must do their best and all telcos take a very holistic view of that. Uh, but telco is also a really good case study in the complexities of this issue uh, with multiple pieces of legislation sort of at crosshairs with each other in regard to telecommunications and the obligations placed on those entities. 
Uh, and a really good example of that is the fact that there are currently four inquiries open with the Parliamentary Joint Committee into Intelligence and Security that relate to telecommunications and telco security in some way. Uh, among those is a review of the telco sector security reforms. Uh, the SOCI Act that we're discussing today, uh, the Access Act, as well as the Assistance and Access Act, um, as well as the, the Surveillance Act. So there's, there's quite a number of things going on in this space from a telco perspective where the primary concern of industry is how are these things going to overlap? Are there going to be duplications in those regulations and obligations? Are there going to be duplications in reporting requirements? Are those requirements going to be consistent? Uh, which element do we prioritise first and foremost? Fundamentally, uh, telcos are commercial entities and these things need to be balanced in a commercially appropriate way, commercially balanced and responsible, uh, while also meeting the obligations placed on us by government. So there's a little bit of tension there, but nothing that I, I don't think can be resolved with some active engagement between all parties. And then there's the complexity of uh, the, just the cyber law landscape um, more broadly. Uh, obviously, we're talking about security of critical infrastructure here today, but we have alongside that and overlaid with that, among many things, digital identity legislation, foreign interference legislation, and a whole suite of other security related legislation that's currently being introduced to the parliament. Uh, so again, great that there's an emphasis there, but there is a very, very high level of complexity with just the sheer number of uh, legislative elements that are in play at the moment. And for everyone on the call who's uh, interested in understanding that that uh, full suite of legislation we're talking about, um, through the University of Melbourne, uh, we've recently launched uh, the cyber law map that's hosted on OSLI. Uh, it's a really great uh, just resource that's there. It's it's open source. It's a wiki. Anybody can contribute to it, uh, but primarily run by University of New South Wales alongside University of Melbourne. That that really is a, a great resource that articulates all of the different legislative areas uh, that are potentially impacted by cyber laws and cyber security. And that's not even taking into account the international dimension. Um, Hamish has already alluded to the issues with uh, supply chains and international supply chains and the department's uh, principles for addressing those supply chain issues are very helpful as a starting point for the discussion for not just critical infrastructure entities, but all entities to understand the risks inherent in their supply chains. Uh, but we've also got to consider as well the potential overlap with international obligations and regulations, particularly for multinational providers, and sort of having to deal with points of contention where Australian law may contradict other laws internationally that apply to a single entity effectively. So there's a, a, another dimension of complexity there as well. And I think that's why this is such a fun area to work in, to be honest. If uh, if a problem's too simple, it's a bit boring, and this is certainly not boring. Um, so there's a lot there. There's a lot to consider in terms of the international political dimension as well. Um, that's been covered by DFAT's launch of their uh, cyber and critical technolo technology engagement strategy, which is another really important piece of this puzzle. Uh, and I think you know, it, it's fantastic to see so much focus on this from the Australian government perspective, because Australia is so well placed to be a leader in this field. We're small enough and big enough to be able to make a big difference, but do so in a way that can be quite agile. Uh, and there's a lot of opportunity there for Australia to really set the standard for how government and private enterprise works together to make these regimes work for absolutely everyone and ultimately result in a greater level of national cyber resilience. Uh, and yeah, as Hamish said, really looking forward to taking any questions that come up along the way. Thanks, Ben. 
when you say four inquiries on foot at once, I feel your pain and multiple inquiries is always fun. <laughs> but also pleasing to hear that you think there's nothing that can't be resolved and you know obviously the co-design process is there. And supply chain does thinking Hamish about your extended bio talks about modern slavery, which is another area completely unrelated to this, but where entities have to work out how can they investigate down through their supply chain and it can be, you know, quite a practical thing to have to consider. Then a good segue to you might be that, you know, Min just talked about entities and I imagine Microsoft is one that might be subject to similar but different rules in different jurisdictions. Um, so it'd be interesting if you have questions on that. So Ben Gilbert is our next speaker. He's the Principal Corporate Counsel for Microsoft Australia and New Zealand. Ben's a team, uh, he's part of a team leading Microsoft's work on critical infrastructure policy as a frontline point of contact for the organisation's Office of Critical Infrastructure, which is based in Washington, DC. Ben's worked with compliance and legal experts on regulatory requirements in the context of procuring hyperscale cloud services, and also with the New Zealand Reserve Bank in support of its consideration to issue cloud procurement guidance for NZ regulated financial institutions. Ben supports projects across Asia, including data center expansion plans, frontline response to cyber incidents, AI use case reviews, and data protection uh, impact assessments for sensitive use cases. Hand over to you, Ben. Well, uh, thank you, Michael, and thank you to IIC and Squire Patton Boggs as well for the opportunity uh, to join today. It's um, fantastic to be on, uh, on a panel of such prestigious panelists. So um, I really welcome. Uh, the, the opportunity to speak. Um, so I'm, I'm Ben, uh, as mentioned, I'm part of a team of, of local and international policy, cybersecurity and legal experts driving Microsoft's engagement um, in this space and particularly with Department of Home Affairs on the proposed critical infrastructure reforms. Um, and, and like the others uh, have and, and like Michael has, I'll, I'll start by Then I can't hear you. Maybe when you move to slide, you mute it somehow. It did too, thank you. So we, we now, I think, can see both the slide and hear me? Correct. Okay, spacebar is muting instead of flicking through slides, so I'll go old school and use the cursor. Okay. Um, I'll, <laughs> I'll start by sort of sharing what Microsoft is saying, I'm sure what, what all of you are seeing, which is that today's world runs on technology and digital infrastructure itself is the backbone that supports national and global economies, critical societal functions and national security. Um, there's a saying in Microsoft circles that every company is a technology company. Um, and that is true. I mean, it was interesting to see the grocery and retail were listed in the uh, 11 new sectors um, under the, the reforms and grocery chains here in particular have highly profitable profitable data subsidiaries, let alone um, their supply chains that are critically important. Mining conglomerates have IoT devices that are, they're using to streamline operations. You know, I could go on with every single industry that's covered by these reforms. So our reliance on technology is accelerating and so are the threats. Um, nation state actors, transnational criminal networks and other adversaries are seeking to debilitate critical infrastructure to disrupt supply chains and they're increasingly able to affect the day-to-day -day functioning of society. Michael, you already referred to the colonial pipeline incident uh, which obviously got a lot of press and an example closer to home for me, uh, you might be able to tell I'm a Kiwi. My parents in New Zealand, I visited them recently when uh, the bubble was open um, and they actually couldn't get their vaccines because their local district health board had been affected by a ransomware attack. Uh, I think, Michael, you referred to a week for Colonial Pipeline and similar for, for the Irish example. Uh, it was at least two weeks that the, the local DHB in New Zealand was down. So I've managed to hit the, the COVID buzzword and um, the cybersecurity in the same example. Um, and more humorously, you know, nations were brought to their knees because of toilet paper supply chain issues, um, although those weren't uh, cyber related, at least that I was aware of. Um, but those attacks aren't only impacting industrial operations, they're undermining trust in technology more generally. Um, and they highlight the work that remains to better protect and secure 
critical digital infrastructure. Um, organizations won't techno use technology they don't trust. People won't use businesses to, they don't trust and governments won't engage well with organizations that, that don't participate in the process. Um, all of which is to suggest that this is the right time to regulate or you know, to advance the regulation of Australia's most critical assets. Um, and we at Microsoft strongly believe that governments have a legitimate interest in increasing oversight and regulation of critical digital infrastructure. We applaud the efforts here. Um, we look forward to supporting their efforts. Um, as critical workloads move to the cloud, regulation and better public-private partnerships will build trust. And so we have an intrinsic interest in being part of this process that expands beyond our interest in, you know, personal interest in making sure that critical infrastructure is, is safe. Um, in that vein, we have been working closely with APRA uh, for, for many years, five or more, um, on their material outsourcing standards. Um, we've worked with, as Michael suggested, with the equivalent, the Reserve Bank in, in New Zealand. Uh, we're in constant discussion with industry leads in this space far in advance of, of this legislation. More recently, um, we've been closely partnering with the Department of Home Affairs itself through the general rules consultation process. And it's great to have Hamish, uh, to have you on the phone, um, because I would like to thank you and your team uh, for the engagement thus far. It's been um, an interesting experience for me. I haven't been part of something like this, uh, and we really welcome the opportunities that you've provided to, to provide this feedback. Um, you know, Mid made the point that new regulation is always complex uh, and multi-sector regulation is even more complex um, and multi-sector regulation that regulates entities that are transnational is even more complex again. So you can, even before looking at all of the different legislation that men referred to, you've got um, multiple layers just within this single regulation. Um, or proposed regulation. And, and we believe that regular, regulatory frameworks like this, this isn't the only example, but th th these sorts of things should set clear, forth clear logical requirements that are flexible, they incorporate global standards and best practices. Um, they should harmonize the requirements across jurisdictions, across industry verticals to the extent that's possible. Um, and they should avoid introducing more complexity through regulatory overlap or unnecessary and conflicting requirements. Um, they should also avoid defeating the purposes of the policy uh, by being too prescriptive about how the policy is to be implemented. And so I think the legislation aims to do that. Uh, we've heard a lot from Department of Home Affairs as to their policy goals in this space, which is really encouraging. Um, we look forward to sort of seeing how the other regulators that are proposed to be involved, um, if, if this legislation is to go through parliament, uh, uh, to approach the, the issues as well. And we will no doubt learn more as sector specific consultations continue. Um, it, we, we know uh, it'll be a difficult task and you know, hats off to Department of Home Affairs and the other regulators for, for taking it on. Um, the, the key message we want to land is that we, and we think other industry leaders should, uh, understand that legislation and policy improves with public and partner, uh, public and private partnerships. Um, we support policymakers desire, both in Australia and, and around the world, to create new regulatory and oversight mechanisms that build trust in cloud and cloud infrastructure. Obviously, this is an example of that, particularly as digital transformation modernizes society and in particular society's most ant antiquated and critical workloads. I think this audience will be part, uh, largely part of telecommunications um, industry, which is actually uh, you know, relatively mature. And you, could, you would say the same for the financial services industry. There are a number of other industries in that list uh, in the proposed reforms that are less sophisticated, very good at knowing their own industry, not as good, we think, at knowing cybersecurity and uh, digital management. And so the government can help with that. We can help with that. Our competitors can help with that, right? Um, 
And and on that, I think, you know, the Department of Home Affairs would do well to recognise that there are differences between the sectors as well. And, and so, you know, FSI Telecom's very mature data uh, storage and processing sector, I would say we're pretty mature in this space as well. And that the idea of the rules setting um, which reforms are applied and not is a, is a good step. And we look forward to working that through in the consultation sessions. My final point is that um, Microsoft has invested in a, an office of critical infrastructure. Um, it's got people in, in DC. Uh, it's a, a hub and spokes model. So obviously I'm the, the pointy end um, for the Australian reforms and, and more generally around Asia. We'll have people like me um, in different parts of the world uh, reporting into a central body based out of Washington, DC. Um, we really look forward in that team to work with customers as well as Department of Home Affairs and other regulators as they navigate this environment. Australia's leading the charge. Uh, we're anticipating conversations with the regulators in Europe, Singapore, Japan, and others. Thank you for listening. Uh, I look forward to any questions that come through. Um, back to you, Michael. Thanks, Ben. I think it's a very interesting point you make about needing flexibility because I guess for policymakers, it's often, often a balance between providing certainty, which many of us standard we seek um, and that flexibility at the same time. I know there are some discretions, for example, built into this proposal in this bill. So you've always then got the exercise of discretionary power to take into account as well. Um, and 10 points for the COVID references, particularly uh, the toilet paper, thank you. <laughs> um, our final speaker is Matthew Kirk. Matthew, thanks again for joining us from the UK. Um, Matthew's International Affairs Advisor with Squire Patton Boggs. Ambassador Kirk is a highly experienced international risk strategist and negotiator of complex multinational issues. He has experience in cyber security, political risk, regulatory issues and reputation risk, as well as external communications, sustainable business and corporate philanthropy. During his time at Vodafone, Matthew created and led the external affairs department there. So Matthew, I'll hand over to you for the EU slash UK perspective on this. Thank you uh, very much, Michael, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's very good to be joining you. I was never going to be able to join you in person, so for me, the virtual is uh, is the way of being there anyway. Um, so it's been a fascinating uh, set of presentations, and I, I should say at the outset that viewed from Europe, uh, Australia is definitely uh, in the forefront of uh, having a comprehensive uh, national strategy on cybersecurity, and, and congratulations to all of you for what you have been doing to contribute to that. Um, let me give you a, a quick summary of uh, of where things are in uh, in the EU and in the UK. Um, in legislative terms, the UK and the EU are at the moment roughly on a par because when the UK left the EU, all existing uh, EU legislation was rolled forward into British law, so the legislative framework has not fundamentally changed yet. Um, the UK was, however, probably ahead of the rest of the EU with the uh, creation of the National Cyber Security Centre, um, which was uh, an initiative um, of the Cameron government, um, and really brought together in a rather unique way a set of uh, capability from the intelligence agencies, uh, and obviously in the UK with uh, GCHQ, we have one of the most advanced electronic intelligence agencies uh, in the world. Um, combined with policymakers and with industry representatives, and I think it uh, it was that recognition that, um, very much as Min was saying, that you can only solve these problems by industry and um, and the public authorities working together which was at the heart of the National Cyber Security Center in the UK and has been very much part of its success in not only tackling a number of major cyber incidents, but also um, raising significantly uh, cyber security standards across the private sector and indeed the public sector. Um, turning to what, what's happening now in legislative terms, I think you undoubtedly the effect of the pandemic is that uh, everyone is much more conscious of um, the uh, the importance of um, 
cybersecurity, of digital services, of the integrity of digital services, and of the extent to which uh, they come under threat um, uh, through cyber attacks. I think everyone is also much more conscious now um, of the role that some states play in uh, fostering uh, cyber attacks or indeed directly carrying them out. And uh, we've seen in uh, in the EU some of the first uh, sort of full on state to state cyber aggressions with the uh, the Russian attack on Estonia a few years back, um, which the Estonians were able to push back, but which was nonetheless a very serious incident. So that consciousness uh, is translating itself into a series of actions. Um, there is already in the EU a directive, the Network Information Security Directive, uh, which is not actually addressed at the telecom sector. The telecom sector has a separate set of cyber uh, obligations. The NIS directive is addressed at other critical sectors primarily. Um, and it is uh, currently in the process of uh, revision with its scope likely to be considerably enhanced, its reporting requirements um, uh, substantially um, uh, sort of shortened and made more onerous, um, and uh, fines for failure to protect adequately uh, digital services on which people are relying, uh, brought in at, at quite high levels, 2% of global revenue, which uh, is not as high as GDPR, but it's nonetheless an amount that um, uh, will make most boards uh, think carefully um, about how well they're protecting uh, the vital assets. Then you've also seen in the EU an enhanced role for ENISA, the EU's uh, cybersecurity unit. Um, there was an announcement just yesterday of a new joint cyber unit. It's not quite clear from the announcement how that relates to ENISA but it's a, an information sharing body to ensure that information about significant cyber incidents is shared as rapidly as possible um, among, uh, among the EU member state authorities concerned. Um, and I, I wanted sort of to end by talking a little bit, a little bit about 5G and the supply chain, because I think this is probably one of the most important areas um, that the EU and indeed the UK have been grappling with over the last couple of years. The, um, the supply chain issues so far have been looked at largely in the context of 5G and not more broadly. Um, and they focus, although most is are too polite to say so, they fo focus um, almost exclusively on China um, and on the major Chinese technology suppliers. Uh, the EU put in place uh, a 5G security toolbox, which was an assessment mechanism designed to help member states um, reach conclusions about how to preserve the integrity of their networks. And what we've seen is a progressive adoption of um, a similar policy to that which Australia adopted, which the United States has obviously also adopted, um, about the use of Chinese technology in 5G. In some cases done uh, very overtly with public announcements and that kind of thing. The UK uh, is an example of that, one or two other countries. In some cases done in a slightly more uh, stealthy way in order uh, presumably to avoid the uh, directly confrontational appearance of a publicly announced ban on uh, on Chinese equipment in 5G. The effect is broadly the same. The European market is gradually closing to uh, the Chinese technology companies uh, for 5G supply. I would expect that this concern about the supply chain and about the integrity of digital services will spread, um, will spread into other critical sectors and other critical services. Uh, and it's not just the telecom sector which will have to think through how best to um, run a supply chain which um, uh, brings the highest assurance um, of, uh, of integrity in, in the future. I would say though that this whole debate has put Europe in a very uncomfortable position um, 
China is uh, an increasingly important economic partner for European Union member states. Um, uh, the UK also has, has gone under something of a reversal since the Cameron government's policy uh, of a new golden age in UK-China relations. Um, Germany's trading account with China is larger than Germany's trading account with the United States. And all of these factors combine to make the issue of the extent to which China is a strategic rival um, or a partner with whom one can collaborate an acutely difficult one in European politics. But as I said, the pendulum is gradually moving uh, in a similar direction to that of the US and, uh, and Australia. Thank you very much, Michael. Very happy to take any questions that anyone wants to ask. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, and thank you for introducing the, you know, that angle on um, the role of state actors and increased awareness of that role and also supply chains, because I guess for telcos or other corporates, they've got to consider you know, who can be in their supply chain in this context. Uh, so thank you all for presenting. We've got a number of questions in the Q&A bar. Um, the first one, we might start with you, Hamish, and, and welcome the thoughts of other panel members as well. Does the making a specific declaration of Australian critical infrastructure assets in, actually increase their risk of being attacked? Well, um, for those uh, systems of national significance that I, I mentioned before, we're, we're not going to make them public. They'll be private declarations. And I think you're right that um, the more you reveal publicly about particularly cyber vulnerabilities, but other security vulnerabilities, the more at risk um, that particular critical infrastructure assets are. So there is a pretty fine balance between the, the issues that um, Min and Ben have raised around co-design and transparency, and then the protection of the information. So we think we've got the balance uh, right, but um, you know, the, the, there's a pretty big security risk out there across um, from some of the actors that I think Matthew mentioned, and um, that we think the balance is right. I imagine there are different views as well. I know it's within the data breach context rather than you know infrastructure protection, but in that 60 minutes I mentioned, the ANU Vice Chancellor talked about having a sort of extreme transparency approach to how they dealt with the attack that they experienced. So I imagine for different reasons, including share prices, you know, other entities may choose to take different positions. Mm, um, right. Janet has asked, oh, sorry, I should ask whether others on the panel have any thoughts about that particular question about the risk being increased by declaration. So acknowledging that some of those assets, key ones will not be de declared but or made public, but. Well, one thing I'd, I'd add is that we shouldn't underestimate the sophistication of these actors, um, I, I think what is classed as a, a critical infrastructure asset will be relatively clear and, and probably are already the target of, of some of these sophisticated actors. So um, the listing them in, in rules or regulation is, I don't think, going to materially shift the dial on whether they're going to be targets of, of cyber attacks. We should assume they're coming anyway and, and prepare for them on that basis. or Ben, this may be a question for you, but the next one was, what companies do you think are leading in the cybersecurity space here in Australia? And do we have a big sector in cybersecurity or are we mostly reliant on overseas companies? Yeah, um, happy to speak to that one. Um, I don't know about uh, which companies I would say are leading in the, the cybersecurity space. Uh, necessarily, but I do think uh, yeah, we've certainly got a growing uh, ecosystem within Australia of industry that's uh, springing up uh, in the cyber security sector. Um, a lot of that has been the result of the government's uh, creation of OSCYBER uh, and the support of the yeah, the sort of innovation hubs that have come along with that. And we've seen a lot of really great startups uh, come through those programs, both through OSCYBER uh, and SciRise. And so we've absolutely got a, a, a growing uh, and thriving sector within Australia that's working within the cybersecurity space. But we've also got 
uh, really great multinational partners um, and vendors and suppliers who we work with quite closely. Uh, Microsoft is one of them. Um, uh, as a Microsoft customer, uh, NBN puts a lot of those uh, Microsoft security tools to work. Windows Defender is a fantastic program with a, a suite of tools, I should say. Uh, and, uh, you know, cloud service providers are doing a terrific job of enabling really robust security practices at the same time. Um, and then there's the, you know, the, the numerous security specific vendors that are out there that are also uh, working with all critical infrastructure entities very closely as well. So I, I, I don't think we're really reliant on overseas suppliers as such because all of these companies have quite a significant footprint within Australia and then obviously we've got the the ecosystem within Australia itself. Thanks Ian. Does anyone else have reflections on that that question in particular? That's fine. I, I might move on and to another one. Um, great discussion from Nicole. She asks how the critical infrastructure bill and the telco legislation interact in Australia. Hamish, you mentioned 11 sectors have been identified, which uh, Nicole thinks would include telecoms. So if so, how are the current requirements of the telco sector taken into account in the new bill? And would the critical sector bill supersede the current legislation? Uh, great, great question. And I, I should have mentioned the sectors. So telco definitely in their space, education, health, food and groceries, defence, gas, electricity, water, data in the cloud and finance. Um, so uh, what, what the government's decided to do is to put um, effectively the design of the legislation through the parliament first. And then, um, as, as I think Min and Ben have both mentioned, co-design the sector specific rules. And the principles behind that, the government said, is that the, as far as um, practically possible, we need to limit and reduce duplication. And I think that's um, very foremost on our mind as we look at the reforms. Um, but there are some things that um, the TSSR regime doesn't do. So for instance, it doesn't have the cyber security reporting obligation and it doesn't have um, the instigation of the government assistance regime. So. Um, I don't want to preempt what's in the rules, but there will be a significant crossover of the existing regulations in TSSR, but there are elements that um, objectively the Minister for Home Affairs is going to have to consider about whether or not um, after the co-design process and, and reflecting on both uh, views of industry and the department, um, she'll have to make a judgment about the final rules, which will then be put before the parliament and, and will be disallowable. Because I think it's also helpful to know that the critical infrastructure as centre as the regulator in home affairs for the 11 sectors um, is also the regulator for the TSSR regime. And, and Hamish, just a question for me, to what extent do those 11 sectors match those that are protected? You mentioned France earlier, but in other jurisdictions around the Asia Pacific, for example. Yeah, um, they, they match pretty well. Um, the US has very similar um, arrangements. I think they've got 13 different sectors. Uh, things we don't include is um, the agricultural sector and the mining sector. Um, we capture both in its supply chain with the transport of goods through ports, but we don't capture individual mines um, as critical infrastructure. Really important for our economy, both agriculture and mining, but not important in the sense of keeping our society functioning. And then earlier you talked about, um, or I think it was you talked about organisations with different but similar obligations in, in different jurisdictions. I wonder if you or Matthew have any reflections on how, how a single entity might manage these different obligations. Yeah, it's challenging in the same sense that I'm sure it's challenging for, for the government to, to try and regulate it around them. And, you know, obviously there's a couple of obvious examples that that we're starting to think about as we go through this process. The first is that we made comprehensive engineering changes in response to the GDPR and the, the California Privacy Act. And there's a, you know, Hamish and others have spoken about security incident notification as it relates to personal information. 
um, and largely uh, our, our processes are architected around the timeframes that are set out in those pieces of legislation. Um, the proposed law, at least for those high tier of critical um, security incidents, sets a uh, faster bar for um, notification and obviously extends beyond personal uh, information to critical data more broadly um, and, and to the extent that the critical infrastructure is at, is at risk of, of being unable to perform. Um, that creates challenges um, straight off the bat as to how we engineer our products, let alone um, whether we're aligned to, to the international standards by which we, we've set. Um, there, there's also, uh, I guess, you know, comprehensive contractual commitments that are that are made on a on a global basis based on laws that are, are set around the world, and we try to operate to the highest watermark um, as changes are made, which might compel uh, other things. Like, you know, there's a difference between law enforcement access under judicial warrant and potentially access to systems in, in certain circumstances. Those are things that we may be uh, we may find uh, find ourselves. Um, in a difficult position on as well. Um, so I think, you know, there are there are a couple of other examples and I, I won't dive deep here. We've we've made submissions um, on the bill that, that people can read and we've, we've got a blog out, but um, certainly those are, you know, the, the only other point I'd make actually is obviously that the Cloud Act was introduced. Australia is working towards um, a Cloud Act agreement, bilateral agreement between the US and Australia, which might help clarify some of these matters. That's probably that is almost certainly farther away um, than the passage of the uh, the reforms, at least on current on our current um, expectations. So um, again, something that we'll be watching closely and and, and working out how we um, you know, operationalize uh, as we ad adopt and change following the passage of that law. Okay, well, thank you. We've got only a couple of minutes left. Um, I know we've talked about infrastructure owners and state actors, and, and the final question we have is really around end users and, and what education programs does Microsoft or anyone on the call undertake for the general public? And what, I guess, more broadly, what role does the general public have in assisting to keep this, these systems protected um, to the extent that they can? My security team would be remiss in not saying that we've got to move past a six figure password and into multi factor authentication. So, to answer the latter part of your question, I suggest um, we evolve the conversation from, from passwords to, to MFA. Um, to answer the question there, what, what education programs do we do? Um, and there, there are sort of three that I'd use. The first is we have certification programs in cybersecurity and, and those are used by cybersecurity professionals by the 10,000 partners in our partner network to help skill up in this space. Um, the second is that we support various state governments in reskilling and skilling people in digital nativity more generally and we've uh, I think got a target of 500,000 new tech um, qualified individuals uh, in, in various states, which we're well on the way to, to achieving in partnership with the DECO and other and, and state governments. Um, and the, the last point I'd make, and again, I think this speaks back to the public-private partnership, is that um, we had a, a zero days uh, attack that was relatively well publicized recently on our on-premises exchange server. We worked very closely with the Australian Cybersecurity Center to help um, them Obviously, we were reaching out proactively to our affected accounts. We had, <clears throat> we were sharing information with the ACSC, and and they were uh, making us aware of of other accounts that they'd uncovered. And um, we worked together on on joint comms to the market. So, I, I think that's the right approach. And to Hamish's point, that's the approach that the legislation is trying to get to as well. Um, <laughs> he and I would probably disagree on the extent to which the the uh, absolute powers are, are necessary um, and, and how they're triggered, but uh, we will discuss that as we go through the process, I'm sure. Sorry, Amish, you might want to respond. Oh, I think um, when you look at the uh, ultimately the powers that could be used, you've also got to balance that against the thresholds prior to the instigation of the powers. And if we're in 
if we're using some of the, the high end powers, we're in a really difficult cyber security event and situation that is um, hasn't occurred in Australia to date. Um, I think Colonial Pipeline is probably the closest, but I think Ben's uh, mentioned that ACSC is a, a key place for cyber.gov.au for technical advisories. And I think um, Matt Matthew also mentioned the NCSC. And I think together, um, we, particularly in the five eyes, we're, we're getting pretty good at um, providing technical information for individuals, companies, small business. The translation is how do you actually push that out and seek to change the environment in less of a passive way, but more of an active way. So everyone's informed and everyone's actually doing um, and making change. Fantastic. Well, we've hit the end of our allotted period. So I'd just like to um, bring the session to a close by thanking each of Hamish, Schmin, Ben, and Matthew and to James and, and Squire Patton Boggs again uh, for hosting us and to everyone on the call for joining us. Um, we will send you an email with further AIC updates and please watch out for those and, and future events. We really embrace the opportunity to have both the national and global perspective on these calls. Uh, so appreciate your time tonight. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Michael.